Um, good evening, everyone. Today is Wednesday, March 22nd, 2023. This is a meeting of the Gloucester School Committee. We are meeting at Gloucester High School Library at 32 Leslie O. Johnson Road in Gloucester. Um, consistent with Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted by remote participation. The public may not physically attend this meeting, but every effort will be made to allow the public to view and listen to the meeting in real time and participate when, when necessary. I will state that the mission of Buster Public Schools is for all students to be successful, engaged, lifelong learners. Um, we are starting by going into executive session, um, and we will then return to open session to continue the rest of our business um, in public. Um, so I will make a motion that we enter executive session for two purposes, one pursuant to executive session purpose three of Mass General Law 39, section 23B to discuss collective bargaining with the Gloucester Association of Educational Support Professionals, and second, the approval of personnel subcommittee executive session minutes of October 22nd, 2020. And I salute. Second. Okay, roll call over here, please. Mr. Melvin. Yes. Mr. Minio. Yes. Ms. Prince. Yes. Mayor Virgo. Yes. Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Wieson. Yes. And Chairperson Clancy. Yes. Okay, so we will be back as soon as we're done. Uh, we are, this is the Gloucester School Committee reconvening in open session on Wednesday, March 22nd, 2023. Um, I ask that you join me. Um, first item of business is oral communication. Um, I will wait for introductions till the presentation. But we do have a wonderful group of educators with us this evening um, around the table for the public to know. Um, for oral communications, if you're calling in on a phone, you can press star nine to request to speak. If you're watching on a computer or device, there's a raise hand button that you can tap or press to request to speak. Please use either of these options during oral communications to be recognized. To speak. Is there anybody uh, in attendance that would like to speak to public comment? Okay, seeing none, um, we will move on to recognitions. Anybody have any recognitions? Just a quick uh, shout out to uh, the O'Malley Middle School play, Beauty and the Beast, that they did a tremendous job with and uh, checking it out and really, really impressed by the, the work by the students, the staff. And such. So great show. Else? I know we have um, East Gloucester's play coming up this weekend on Friday at six, Saturday at one. Um, Peter Pan Jr. So anybody in attendance, please join and celebrate these kids. Okay. Um, uh, Gloucester High School Student Advisory Council. Kaya, thank you so much for being patient with us this evening. Thank you. Um, so I just have a few things, actually more than a few, but, um, so tomorrow we have NHS inductions that are taking place at 630 in the auditorium. This is one of the biggest NHS groups that we've had. We have 62 new inductees, and that's double the amount of kids we have on this year. Um, freshmen just finished up their candy grams for... St. Patrick's Day, so students were able to go during lunch and buy candy grams to be sent to their friends, to their peers, like, and other students that would be sent out last Friday. Um, junior event tickets were on sale all of last week. We have around 180 tickets for junior event that's gonna be held at the cruise port. Um, the prom tickets are going on soon. Prom is June 1st at Danvers Port. The senior banquet is next week at the cruise port and the centerpiece contest is like going, everybody's trying to figure out what everybody's doing. But as we all say, nobody has done one better than Miss Cassie, Kathy Clancy. Yeah. Oh, that was my son, Neville. <laughs> <laughs> um, MCAS will be in a few weeks. And then after that, SATs are coming around the corner for juniors. 
Um, the senior countdown started last week and we have 44 days until we're out of the high school. Um, the spring sports tryouts have been happening all this week and they seem to be going pretty well. Everybody's finding what they want to do this spring. Some are continuing sports from last year. It's going pretty well. The blood drive last Friday was incredibly successful. We met our goal and we got a lot of blood and I believe it was um, every pint of blood saves three lives or it might be more, but we were really happy with the outcome. Um, the spring musical Anastasia will be performed by the GHS Theater Group on April 6th, 7th, and 8th. 8th? 8th? Yeah. Tickets are $15 for adults and $10 for students and seniors. The electives fair was held on March 15th, where the class of 2027 was able to meet with students and staff and talk about opportunities at GHS and where their future four years at Gloucester High School could lead them. There was a, su a successful college fair last week with over 85 colleges in attendance, open to anybody most, it was a lot of like juniors and sophomores, but it was open to everybody. Um, course selections have like kind of began. So for the class of 2027, they're all in motion, they're all in. And then um, I believe juniors, sophomores and freshmen meet with their guidance counselors in a few weeks about it, unless they already have. Um, four seniors so far signed up to do the American Exchange Project this summer, so they'll be traveling around the country while some people come here, and we're still looking for more seniors to, to do it, but so far we have four, which is good, and the American Exchange Project's mission is to create a more perfect union. Also, last but not least, the Interact Club has the pizza taste-off on April 5th at the cruise port. And so I believe we'll have some new people and some old people, well, not old, but like similar people, familiar people, and everybody's welcome to join. All proceeds go to the American Cancer Society. So that's really good. I believe we have a, like almost all of the pizza shops in Gloucester going and yeah, so it should be really fun. That's all I have. That's great, thank you. Can you tell me more about the pizza? Well, is that open to the public? Mm -hmm. Yes. It is okay. okay. Was, so was, I think we buy a ticket. And what's the time? Um, let me see. I don't think they told me the time. Yeah, they didn't tell me the time. They just told me that it's April fifth. So I will find out the time, and I will I will email you. Thank you. No problem. Well, thank, thank you so much. Thank Have you. Have a good day. Good night. Oh, Okay. Um, next item of business is a consent agenda. Does anybody have any items they would like to remove? I just have a question on one of them. I don't know that we need to remove it. It's just a quick question because I didn't see it. I mean, I don't know anyone else. Um, I just wanted to know how many chaperones were on the out of state. I didn't see it on the form. On the for, for DECA? Yeah. Uh, I thought it was two or three kids, three students going and the two adults going. Oh, okay. I thought I was the application was in a packet, but I couldn't determine that. Yeah. So um chaperone, so it says uh Christine Simmons is going. Okay. Chaperones uh Scott Belmonte. Um that's really true. Yeah, just the two. Yeah, just the two of them. Two chaperones and how many kids? Three students. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'll give you a little update about the students that are going in a moment. We want to make a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Mr. Melvin. Yes. Mr. Minion. Yes. Ms. Prince. Yes. Mayor Berga. Yes. Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Wieson. Yes. Jefferson yes. Lance. Yes. Okay. Um, next, we have deliberation on education issues and the superintendent's report. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Kathy. So uh, a couple things tonight. I'll give a short report about a bunch of things that are going on, have been going on in the district, and then we have a, a team of coaches here who will help us understand all the great things that are happening in K to five. Uh, that are seeing math. Let me um, pull this up. I just want to move that to see how it works. Okay. So as we say, uh, the Gloucester Public Schools, every day matters. 
and everybody belongs. Uh, that's students, staff, families, everybody. Um, so a couple of things. So uh, GHS students, uh, we are working uh, many levels for um, transition from eighth grade to ninth grade, but from mainly uh, into, the, into the high school and a bunch of GHS students uh, and faculty members organizing electives and activities fair that happened at Amelia Middle. You can see the, quite a list there of different information booths that were staffed by uh, GHS students and, and staff, robotics, engineering, uh, Marine Corps JRTC, theater, music, fine arts, foreign languages, photography, metal fabrication, CAD, uh, or CBT programs were, were, recognized, were um, represented there as well. A couple nice photos uh, on the right, uh, um, uh, Marine Corps JRTC on the left, Harvard Tech students uh, demonstrating uh, makes demonstrations there, but uh, a lot of energy, well received, and I, and I as I always will love when our students as they always step up and help the you know kids who are younger than they are, um, but also step up to serve and and, and will take a leadership role. So another example of how our high school students are doing that support the melee students and this in this way on um, transition. Uh, he's learning about all of the, so many different things that they get involved and participate in at the high school. So great work by the students and staff from the high school. Um, the annual Veterans School Pie Parade, which I which uh, I experienced for the first time. Um, so every uh, that's on March 14th, but uh, this year was on March 16th because someone called a early release day on March 14th. Um, <laughs> I think pretty well executed. Um, but so uh, what they do, at, I didn't bring a sheet, but um, at Veterans School, this is, I think it's the fifth year, at least the fifth year of, uh, of a Pi Day. And uh, students who want to uh, memorize the numbers of Pi. So 3.14159265855. Wow. And I think at this point, Matt, um, Fosco would go, eh. <laughs> but anyway, uh, by the end of the day, I could do, I could do 20. But the uh, kids who are the top, um, you see fourth grader Carlos Ayad here memorized the first 84 numbers of pi. Okay. Um, second place was Mia uh, Fune, 82 consecutive numbers. So they were neck and neck there. And then third was Natasha Villa Sanchez, 72 numbers. Uh, so um, I saw Natasha go, and I could not believe it. It was quite impressive. Um, and then Pi Day is wrapped up with, oh, also also uh, attending that day was Ava Harrington, who's a three-time Pi Day champion. She's now a sixth grader. She came back to help out, again, for older kids helping out younger kids, support them, and she passed her crown to Ayad. During the Pi Day parade, you can see there on the left, with the big dog, um, <laughs> Otherwise known as Principal Matt Fusco. Mm -hmm. And he's in a big dog costume. Uh, and you can see uh, Perolis, um, uh Mia, and Natasha there. So, very fun day. Our Millie Science uh, Labs were highlighted in an almost two hour episode of Cape Band Today. They thought it could be an hour, but they got so much great filming and students speaking and teachers speaking and showing a lot of uh, B roll as well of, of folks working in. Uh, the lab there, uh, you can see that um, on uh, our Facebook page has a link to it. You're hoping maybe to cut down to make some shorter uh, snippets that are more easily watchable, but it's just a fantastic production by um, the, the, the 1620 Studios crew, but also um, with Corey Cooper there and, and, and Heather Atwood. Um, and then, of course, our Amanda team, um, students, staff, uh, Amy Donnelly helped out a lot. Uh, Dave Brown did as well. And Mike Gaffney was a big help too. So just a nice job. Um, and then here we have the, uh, the um, once again annual Cape Band Regional Career and, and Educational Advancement Fair. So this is uh, what used to be known as a college uh, college fair. It's now it's now college and career. Uh, we hope it here at the field house where we have the best facility anywhere on Cape Ann uh, for this type of event. And it's sponsored by the um, Cape Ann, the Great Cape Ann, um, Cape Ann Chamber of Commerce. And also a lot of effort on our staff, our custodians, Laura Carlson and others. There were 80 colleges and universities and about um, representatives from about 40 other local businesses, all trying to help kids understand uh, and make decisions and be informed about their next, their next step in graduation. Um, 
So a great, great day uh, after that uh, evening, rather. Um, and uh, and then glad to see here that's uh, back up and running. And then um, again, the the DECA conference here, uh, as we just uh, you just approved the trip. And that's a culmination of the work that DECA has done um, this year. So a bunch of folks were involved in the State Career Development Conference, uh, which it took place in Boston. Uh, so a bunch of folks, uh, Isla or Isla? Isla. Isla, 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 Isla Black, <laughs> Jessica Harvey, um, Belia Rin uh, competed, but also um, Kira O'Brien uh, competed as well. And, um, and just did a great job. They presented things on, um, on financial consulting, on, um, on banking, on principles of business, on principles of marketing. Um, and three folks, Isla Black, Jessica Harvey, and Velia Rin will be moving on to uh, compete uh, at, the, uh, at the national conference and uh, competition in Orlando later in April, which is pretty fantastic. Um, and uh, so congratulations to them, and then we'll work. See a photo of their little lodge. So I'm just also really glad to see that's uh, five young women doing very well in the DECA. It's great. Those are smart. You're right in here. And not dispute that, seeing as it's surrounded by level women right here. And I can say, as a mom, my two sisters also probably you know, hear about it if I did. Anyway, um, and then uh, one more thing, a couple more things is, uh, doing a great job in kindergarten registration this year. So uh, have really um, stepped that up. We have um, probably more than half our class already registered. So for this time of year, meaning you know mid to late March, that's um, that's unheard of actually. It's been doing really well, and it's because we're doing a lot more outreach. So uh, had kindergarten registration nights at each school. So we're doing that again, but also we're offering mobile kindergarten registration. So you can see um, we're having had already. Registration nights at a Wellspring House at YMCA. Uh, we'll be doing one of the pathways to the Upper Housing Authority, um, and also at uh, community centers at Riverdale and also uh, Willwood Housing. So those are upcoming as well. Uh, we're offering translation. Um, when we uh, do do a number of these uh, registration, mobile registration uh, sites, and again, it's really having an impact both you know, getting out into the community. Uh, we're also going to all the feeder preschool as well. Doing presentations at the Peter Preschool so they know about registration, they know about our, our kindergarten, how great it is. We're showing the video, we're going to be showing the video, it's a great video. Um, and so, just really having a lot of success in terms of getting um, folks uh, registered, or getting families registered early, which, is, um, which can help us then communicate with them about um, events that are happening, you know, uh, kindergarten events, become kindergarten events, and make sure we're well connected with them. And also, another piece has helped them with guidance on how to. Help their child be ready for kindergarten too. So the earlier we can connect with those families, the better. We're doing a great job. And then our last update here is the Power of Play is back as well. Um, so G Cloth Education Foundation sponsored and presented and organized a lot of support from ourselves, from the um, our staff. Um, it'll have to be taking place at the Field House this Sunday, March 26th, from 11 to 2 p.m. Um, and great support from Avian Savings Bank, um, the Story Free Library, and others. But that's going to be uh, a day of our, our sort of afternoon of hands-on, screen-free play for all ages. We're going to break things into six playstations. That doesn't mean the electronic versions. Okay, so also, and they have each playstation, each station has a theme. The themes that's here are discover, touch, games, create, move, and build. So we're going to have a, a great um, multicultural approach uh, to the um, power of play and uh, should be exciting and fun for all ages, all families. So I think that's all I have in terms of uh, updates from me, reports from me. And I'd like to pass it off to um, Amy Pascarello and our- Could I just add one thing? Oh, the power of play. I, I hear the dark side of split playing. Oh. With a guest. With a, a guest. Uh, uh, a guest uh, bassist. Mm -hmm. well, um, and I guess basis would be have to also be <laughs> the mayor. Say, know. What time? Uh, I don't know what time we're going on. I, I rehearse with them tomorrow, so I'll let you know. Well, oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sorry for forgetting that. Thank you for the people too long. Thank you too. Appreciate it. So the door should be like busted. Yeah, get there early. Yeah, you put it in practice. All right, so. Um, 
With me tonight are six of the fabulous nine coaches that we have at the elementary level. Um, we have um, Melissa Francis, Alex Osborne, who are two of our literacy coaches. We have Jenny Emmett Conrad and Shannon Borowski and Ihorn, Ihorn, and uh, Kristen Parsons as our math coaches. Um, they're going to give us a, um, an update of what's happening at the elementary level, both with curriculum and um, some data and some progress that we're making. Okay. And I think I'm kicking it off with Melissa and Alex. So tonight we're going to go um, briefly through the data and then talk about the new platform that we're actually um, piloting in a couple of the schools and then give you the literacy update with the new curriculum in place. And then we're going to hand it off to the math so that they can discuss their curriculum and the assessment as well. So the M-Class is our new platform. Um, you have heard of Dibbles that we've been using forever now. Um, they were always through the platform U Oregon. And now Amplify has taken them on and they call themselves M-Class. Um, and it's the same Dibbles eight assessments but there's some additional assessments and some more efficient way of delivering and scoring the information. So we're really excited about it. But as I stated, a couple of the schools are piloting and a few schools are still using the U Oregon this year, but then next year we will all be doing um, the M class next year. So when you look at the data, it won't actually be from the M class site this year. We um, got creative and <laughs> creative and created the um, Part so that you could still see all five schools, the entire district, even though this is not the way it will be presented in the future. Um, so if you're looking at the beginning of the year data, you can see um, zero shows up. Do you have them? Um, zero shows up because it's kindergarten yeah. and the way that you have to format it in um, Google Sheets, it doesn't allow me to put the K or it won't read it. So there you have it, but I didn't fix it up on my screen, but that's fine. Um, no worries. Um, <laughs> so that is kindergarten, not zero. Um, so you can see at the beginning of the year, we had 95 students who are considered intensive need. That's okay with us because we don't expect them to know anything that we haven't told them yet. Um, so we begin the instruction um, and then you'll see in the next slide that things have changed. But this is just a glimpse um, at the beginning of the year because we are trans um, transitioning. Right now, I would say that um, we have the 58% meeting or exceeding benchmark at the beginning of the year for K through five. And then the middle of the year, you can see 64% are meeting or exceeding at the middle of the year K through five. So we're making some progress. We expect about 70 or more percent by the end of the year. And our goal is always around 80 to 85%. Um, we just made some huge instructional shifts in our curriculum. Um, so we'll be talking about that and um, showing you how we believe the data will really be changing. So we consider the data right now our starting point because of all of the shifts in curriculum that we've made um, over time. But there's some exciting things in the data that I do want to point out. Um, yep, no, go forward. <laughs> um, I'm going to show you the samples, some of our strengths and some of our needs based on those instructional shifts. So on the next slide, you can see I focused in on K through two and it says beginning of the year and then the middle of the year. We were able to cut the kindergarten intensive need from 95 to 41. Um, so that's a significant number. We were able to cut it more than in half. Um, and this is again, just from the beginning to the middle of the year. So I've we can assume that by the end of the year, it will look even better. We are able to um, increase, if you look, our exceed standards. So not only meet standards, but exceeds from 29 to 58, which is a significant jump. And these are real numbers. These are student numbers. Um, so number of students, the number of students, yes, yep. And then you can see the percentages down at the bottom as well. Um, and then first grade, 71 to 56. And again, that increase in meeting or exceeding. So in first grade, we made a significant jump. Um, and then in second grade, you'll start to see, especially to the middle of the year, we're slowing them down a little bit and starting to focus on that comprehension piece. Um, so you don't see quite the growth in the fluency until the end of the year, because that's when they all start to put it together. Um, so we'll see that huge leap there um, at the end of the year. And then if you um, look at the star data, um, this is 
really why we took on wit and wisdom and we knew that this was our area of need when we were thinking about our curriculum and shifting um, was a comprehension. So the STAR actually measures the vocabulary and comprehension for our students. So I highlighted fourth and fifth grade. You can see, again, when we're talking about comprehension, we're not going to see huge leaps and bounds from the beginning of the year to the middle. We hope to see from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Um, but you can see um, that we went from 75 to 88 from fall to winter. That was a jump for us um, for meeting or exceeding. So just so you know, because they like to confuse us in one platform for divils, exceeding is blue, but star platform, exceeding is green. <laughs> um, so it does shift just so you can um, follow along with me here. Um, it does change, but you can see that even from fifth grade for the meeting or exceeding, we were able to move that meeting from 44 to 61. Um, and that again, it's in a short window of time when you really think about when we're assessing them. So again, we expect to see more gains from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, but also in the years to come because of all the shifts that we're making in the curriculum. Question? Yeah, why don't, I mean, just I'm curious more than anything else, Melissa, why don't you see uh, the exceeding expectations? You know, I mean, it seems like it kind of kind of stops right there at meeting expectations. Why, why is that? Well, I think because we knew that this was our area of need and we were realizing that children weren't bringing the vocabulary that they needed um, in the younger years to the upper grades. They weren't having the background knowledge and the understanding. Um, so that's why we really have shifted. And these, all of these students, because we're talking district wide, yeah. and we've only implemented in about 50% of the classrooms, haven't had the opportunity yet to build that background and to get vocabulary. Yeah. So I really think that over time, you will see the exceeding mark really take off because just listening to the students and listening to the teachers in the curriculum, which we will be talking about, you can see the shift in discussion, um, the Socratic seminars. I mean, the conversations that we walk into in the classrooms, children are building their knowledge and really having a depth of understanding that they just didn't have before. So even in one year's time with our curriculum shift, we're really seeing an impact. So I believe it will start to show in the data as the years go on. Like I said, this I feel is our starting point. Yeah. And especially as you have like, you know, kindergartners who know with wisdom, and, and then when they're in third grade, then meaning second grade, third grade, that like, six years of building, you yeah. know, I mean, as it you know, should, you know, yeah. to really grow in yeah. the year, as opposed to right now, we're just seeing you know, like half a year you know, for some of the kids, right? So, that over time should, should really build. Absolutely. So just to give you a little glimpse of what the M class does and why we shifted platforms. I feel like every time we talk to you, we're like, we're making another shift, we're taking another leap. <laughs> um, because things are constantly changing and improving and growing. And we want to spend the most time really focusing on what the students' needs are and providing the intervention that they need and the instruction that we need. We don't want to spend time assessing them. So we're always looking for better, more efficient ways to be able to do the assessing so that we can get to the good stuff and really focus on the instruction. Um, so. We knew that Dibbles was really fantastic and we wouldn't let that go, but then they offered it in a different way and it really streamlined it digitally for us, but kept it the same for the students. Um, and it gave us immediate information that we were able to use instructionally, create, analyze, use for reporting purposes. Um, and if you don't know what to do, um, it also offered dyslexia screening tools, which was really important to us because we know with Jesse and all of the Massachusetts guidelines, um, dyslexia has become, you know, quite the hot topic. And it offered rapid naming, which is something we always did as an additional subtest outside of our um, platform. So again, more time, more, you know, more assessing, more pulling particular students. This was just part of their repertoire. So it was so much easier for us. And it was quick, efficient information. So, so the data now lives in one, one place. So at a glance, <laughs> teachers can see how their students are doing, which is really nice. It's amazing. Um, and this is an example for us. We have an iPad. So the teacher, as you see, has the iPad in her hand and she's doing the scoring. But the, the student sees exactly what they used to say with devils. So to them, nothing's changed, but for us, everything has changed, um, which is amazing. 
And then this is the sample right away at the teacher's fingertips that we can look at and analyze the student where before it was in a paper copy and we'd be flipping pages saying, oh yeah, this is what they did here. Oh wait, you wanna talk about Johnny and have to go through you know, 16 packets to find that piece of paper that we were trying to explain what happened. Now we can just press a button and it's digitally there for you, which you got to experience during the data meeting time, which is amazing. But just quickly looking at this, we can say, okay, the student isn't completely blending yet. They're at the starting point that they're still decoding, that they have some vowel confusions, and we can dive right into that discussion rather than taking the time to find the information to share with the teacher to get it to them. Um, it's right there for everybody to see. So this M class is a platform that allows you to do that. It's like yes. a dashboard. For it's a dashboard. Yep, yeah, yes, absolutely. And does it fall under? I wrote a note earlier. Does it? I've expressed this to Ben. One of the one of the problems I have is like I'm a huge fan of wisdom. Sounds like an O'Malley. We're introducing Amplify. Maybe does it? Does it? Is it cross sectional? I mean, regardless of where that data is coming from, it can get to M class. Is that what I'm hearing? Or, or yeah. So the wit and wisdom no. da data is not part of this. This is a okay. screening for dibbles. So it, what it's doing is it's testing or measuring student fluency in reading. Yeah you know, that letter knowledge and the ability to blend. And yeah. um, so it drives our instruction for students that are, if they're doing well at tier one with wit and wisdom, and, and for this is probably more foundations related, yeah. the phonics of it. Um, if they're doing well and, and we can keep pushing, that's great. If we're finding little glitches, that's telling our coaches that they are gonna recommend some extra fluency practice, or they're gonna recommend a double dose in foundations, or they're gonna recommend some sort of intervention. We've been talking about MPSS, those multi-tiers of systems of support. So this will drive instructions if somebody needs a tier two or an extra intervention. Yeah, so we have curriculum-based measures, and then we have standard-based measures. And these are standard-based big picture to give us information about where the breakdowns are for the students. But then the teachers also have the curriculum-based measures along the way with the um, programs that we Once have. again, I'm somehow gaffed. The, uh, <laughs> no, 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 the way I would, the way I describe it is, um, you know, if, if a child's having a glitch with a reading, okay, yeah. what are supported by the coaches, our teachers can figure out what, what part of the reading process that, that glitch is happening. Uh, like, and instead of just having a sense or a guess or, or a, you know, a feeling, it literally can like dig down in this data and, 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 and let's say you use all the terms I can't, okay? Um, and, 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 but, but the different terms that these folks use show the depth of understanding we have of teaching reading things. It's categorically different than 10, 15, 20 years ago because we really understand the science behind it. And, and, and this allows us, like I said, to quickly find a, 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 a different glitches, different kids may be having. So, very powerful. Got it. And it, from the example that you gave us about the starting, that helps us to analyze how our curriculum is working in the like a global perspective. 100%. So I think, you know, we, we use this data to assess the curriculum. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So our dibbles would really assess our foundations, and then the star would absolutely assess our win wisdom. And of course, they you know go back and forth because one thing impacts the other. But ultimately, those are the tools that we use to really determine. Got it. And we're gonna show you just a little bit, a little bit more about foundations, geos, win wisdom, the different pieces of the full curriculum because these guys are here. <laughs> Um, just to continue too, that there is a homeschool connection that's really well done in M plus, and it shows here because I figured why not? Let's put two things together. These are the additional assessments that we weren't offering before, and now we can in a quick um, way. Are they capturing the vocabulary? Are they able to use vocabulary? And they actually ask them two different questions about the same vocabulary words to really capture if they have the understanding. Spelling is another subtest that we didn't have before. We are again doing an additional subtest at a different time, paper and pencil, a lot longer, um, and it's quick at their fingertips and assess. And the rapid automatized naming, which can be confusing, is basically how quickly can I retrieve information I know and get it out? And that is a huge indicator for students who struggle with reading or have dyslexia. So that piece is 
wonderful to have here because we really, really needed that information for us because children who have a deficit in that area, we need to provide overlearning. We need to provide additional repetition of practice. And as Amy stated about the tiers, that's an immediate concern for us to say, okay, that child needs the repetition of practice in a second tier or even a third tier. And then we would provide this home information. Okay, we want you practicing this, this, and this because they need to overlearn. I'm curious to know if you know off the top of your head how the spelling parts go in. I mean, with all the social media and everything going on in the world, I know it's going to check to get my granddaughter, and I'm like, okay, five, five letter words have now become two letter words, right? They know what they're talking about. I don't. So, how how do you see the spelling part of it now that we're analyzing it um, in well, conjunction with social media and all the the new way that kids communicate. I would say that over the years, spelling has definitely taken a nosedive, no yeah. question. But I think with our curriculum that we are putting in place, um, foundations really is to mastery for both reading and spelling. So I think that we are doing our part in education in school, but I can't speak to the rest. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to highlight oh, that area. <laughs> Thank you. You make me spiral down. <laughs> 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 What, what are the strategies for, for like spelling in general? I'm, I'm just wondering, are people still, are kids still using pencils or are they mostly focus on learning on computers when it comes to like learning how to spell? So again, that's, knowing that like writing it out helps you absolutely. learn. Mm -hmm. So again, part of the foundations program, just as an example and wit and wisdom is we are trying to move um, away from the digital all the time. COVID forced us into that, it kind of forced our hand. But we are trying to shift back because we do know that multisensory, and that's exactly what writing is, is you are writing about it, you're thinking about it, you're seeing it, you're touching it. Um, so we are trying really hard to make sure that that's a piece um, that's a focus in our program. And the foundations even starts in kindergarten with the formation of the letters. So there's so much emphasis on paper. Control. Yeah. Um, I have a question before I say that. My daughter's first grade is doing what was done this year, and we've not done it. Then zero homework on the computer. Same time. <laughs> <laughs> lunch. It's all been, you know, just us uh, sitting with a piece of paper between us, having a conversation or playing a game. And I, hands down, I can't thank you enough for that because it, kindergarten is very different. There's a lot of computer work. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just big, makes a big difference for sure. So, my question <clears throat> can you go back to the home? How is this being shared with families and when? <laughs> so, <laughs> again, because it's piloting this year, um, we have similar um, pieces that we have shared in the past. Typically, parent, um, it will go home at parent conferences or during report card time, or you know, the coaches will say, this needs to go home. And I usually will send like a little class dojo message, like, hey, this is going home. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, but usually we try to do it face-to-face -face during the parent conference time at the beginning of the year or when they're expecting information like that. And a lot of our teachers do progress notes and that would be the time. Um, but it's always something that you have access to. So it's something you can ask for. And again, because it's a new platform, people are still learning. Um, but in the future, you should see something like this going home. During report card time, I would say during our benchmarking, would be the most appropriate. So beginning of the year, midpoint, and then end of the year. And um, across the board or only if there's a concern? Well, I think that it depends. And I think that's something that we could definitely discuss is making more universal. Um, I, I can only speak to what happens at my school. Um, we typically, I pass them out to the teachers during their parent conference time and say, hey, can you add this in in the conversation and happy to be there if you need me and things like that. So I give them all of them, yeah. but I don't know for sure if everybody gets them. <laughs> I'll be honest about that. Yeah, I mean, I'm just one person on the committee, but I would love it to be personal. Yeah. I think more information, the better. I think obviously there needs to be some support for staff around parents' concerns. Right? There's obviously gonna be a lot of questions around some of this. Um, because we've been feeling a lot more, yeah. I think, by giving you more information, but I think you're also gonna be some anxiety. And um, I think just the more information, we do this for a reason, and families really need to be a part of this conversation. Um, and so far, it seems like a lot of this is unless you ask, um, or unless there's a big concern that it's shared. 
Right. So this yeah. platform is only at three schools this year because of the pipeline. Yeah. So next year would be a year that we could be talking about. Absolutely. Like that. And I keep saying I really believe that this is a starting point. I feel like every time we come to you, it's something new and exciting. And we really, really are just <laughs> at the starting point. But I do believe that those discussions with the coaches will happen because we just told our coaches the greatness of this, right? The pilot. So then next year, they'll be learning how to use that and implement it. And then I would say the following year, we can really create those universal things, just like we have with the curriculum now. That makes sense. Thank you. So we're going to jump into the um, curriculum updates unless there's anything else about the data, um, because we're really excited. Um, <laughs> we were always in a good place, I will say, with our phonics instruction, but we're finally in a place that we're all doing the same thing. Um, so that was really exciting for us, um, that we are in full implementation K through three for foundations. So when I say foundations, I mean that we are teaching the same phonics rules at the same time in first grade, whether you're at Beeman, East Gloucester, Plum Cove, West Parish, it doesn't, or Vets. It doesn't matter where you are. If you're in unit two, we all know what you're teaching. Um, if we're unit 10, we know that we're there with you. So it's really exciting because we can offer suggestions when we get together at PLC times or common planning times, everybody's speaking the same language. And the fantastic thing about foundations is it does start with the letter formation, it has letter sound. So, and it starts to work on both directions for reading and spelling. And then the geodes, which is also fully implemented. Um, and Amy, you can, yeah, so this is foundation. I'll probably do it one more time like okay. that. It's probably easier. Um, so this is foundations. So this is what the students basically see if they're living in a foundations classroom. Um, and it's really working with the letters and sounds. And then the exciting thing is we also have geodes, and these are just some of the examples of the first themes, just because they were um, easily accessible and beautiful to see, um, basically. Um, but they have reoccurring words and themes throughout the books so that they make connections not only in the school year, but also throughout the pathway from K through five. And this is the bridge between the foundations and the wit and wisdom. So geodes are the connected texts but they also have only control text. So if they're in the second book of geodes, it's only with the skills that they've learned in foundations. 80% or more of it is controlled and they've already been taught. So it's explicit instruction, but it also connects to wit and wisdom with their themes and their vocabulary in the context that they're learning. So talk about a great bridge so that they're learning both and building that background knowledge right from kindergarten on up they start with picture books with no words because in foundations, you're only learning three letters, right? So then suddenly they're starting to draw in more and more. And by the end of kindergarten, they're bringing in all of that they've learned. And then in first grade, they start out with very simple and then move into the more complex. So it's connecting foundations and wit and wisdom every step of the way. This is our wit and wisdom. And we've talked about this before that um, there's four modules. And the color coding is actually um, based on whether it's science, geography, um, English language arts. And again, the themes will reconnect over the grade levels. So even though it says Cinderella, you would think, oh, it's ELA. It's actually geography because it talks about the different areas of the world and the cultures that are connected through the stories of Cinderella. Um, and then they will talk about other cultures and make those connections later on in the grade levels. You're excited, huh, Bill? <laughs> We're giving it a different title. <laughs> Simplify. Right? <laughs> Um, so this is just a great quote, and we're going to take you through the different pieces, because this is really challenging to implement a program like this. It dives deep. It's a lot of information. When you're trying to build background knowledge for students, you have to have background knowledge as adults. Um, it takes time for the lesson planning. Um, so it's required a lot on our teachers and on our students and all of us. Um, so we have chosen as a district to really build the knowledge, the vocabulary, and the language in these content building books. Right? So exciting to see these books in the classroom. Today, I walked into a third grade classroom and they were comparing and contrasting two different books and half the room was divided and they had the books out about space. And it was just so beautiful to watch and the kids were so engaged and so excited about it. And everything happens through 
I do it with you as the teacher. I start, I explain exactly how it's going to go. Then we do it together with guided practice. And then I release you to do it on your own. And it's a beautiful thing to watch in the classrooms happening. Um, skillful implementation. This has been a change of um, thinking, planning, building routines. The teachers will say things like, there are no routines. I don't know what I'm going to get the next day, you know, because there's so much information. And as you know, when you have discussions that can take you in a million different directions with students and you're redirecting them, but we always tell them, just keep thinking of the four domains of language. We want them listening to great text and information. We want them discussing great text and information. We want them reading great text and information. And we want them to be writing about that. So if you're touching on all four domains of the language every day, then you're doing your job. Um, there's a module that you just saw, and then there's arcs within that, that they're focusing on particular questions and diving deeper. And it always ends with a writing test that they do. So it wraps it up nicely and we can really see clearly in their writing, did they comprehend what it is in this module that we were hoping they did? Are they using the vocabulary? Are they using concise language? Are they capturing what they were expected to? Um, yeah, just a question. So 50% of the district is using waiting system at this point. So what, how do you envision, so and next year it'll be full of it. Yes. So how do you envision sort of transition for the students who haven't been doing it, right? So there, you know, it looks, it sounds like perhaps there'll be two different levels going on. Well, I think that would be really the peer education. I think it's great because some kids will bring to the table like, hey, I've had experience in this. Let me help you, you know, because, oh, I know how to do that Socratic seminar. Let me help you. Um, just as we all learn at different paces and rates, it's not like they will be missing critical information. Like if the foundations example, if we did it that way, then if the grade wasn't doing it, they would miss out on follow teams. You know, <laughs> so building background knowledge along the way, I mean, they experience inside school, outside school, all around, and they are still building background knowledge with the curriculums that we had in place before, but just not at the level of depth. So it's not like they're going to be walking in blind. And a lot of the teachers, even though they're not fully implementing, they're just starting to explore and create some of that language and routines in their classrooms now anyway. I was thinking the same thing yeah. last time we heard this. Yeah. yeah. Um, if we honestly, it, you, as you know, you have to go slow to go fast. Yeah. And if we tried to implement with everybody right now, we would be drowning. <laughs> and truly, like the teachers would feel that they didn't have the support that they needed. Right. We actually, this is the perfect slide for that. Collaboration is the strategy because through this experience of the slow rollout implementation, we've created PLC times that teachers who are working with it are working with teachers who aren't working with it yet. So they're hearing about it, they're seeing the manuals, they're learning as they go. We've created literacy leader groups. So the, the teachers who have been working with it are actually creating Google Classrooms for the teachers who haven't or who will be coming. They're creating visitations and allowing people to come in and watch. Um, all of that thoughtful planning wouldn't have happened if we were all like, okay, everybody's going to be the guinea pig. Let's go for it. Um, so giving us the time of the slow rollout really has made the impact and difference that we needed um, for it to be successful. And we're just continuing to coach along the way, and we offer tons of professional development. Um, I'm really excited about um, the next slide. This is the professional development that we are offering along the way. So teachers are being trained every step of the way. Um, and we're constantly getting feedback from them to how to make it better for the next time um, because we're living and learning with this program and we just have to take it as it comes. So the blue column is what we, the piloters last year were trained. So that was a while ago, right? Um, anything, well, this is current before yesterday, anything up to <laughs> <laughs> um, is what has was taught, was given to teachers who are currently implementing. Yesterday, you'll notice we were on the upcoming, that is the opening of training teachers for next year. We had the manuals in their hands for about a month now. So we, we got them the manuals ahead of time so they could look at it, peruse it, they could go watch a colleague's lesson and kind of see how it would work. And then yesterday was the first um, opening training of, you'll see several more moving forward um, to support teachers um, learning growth. Is there a, sorry, is there, a, is there a target date for 
everybody's going to be immersed in wisdom. Is it two years out or September? September. Opening of school next year. Yeah. And then, if I'm right, special educators also involved. Um, Paris so yesterday. they did, but tomorrow we have a special training um, for specifically special education, special education teachers, EL teachers, and Title One teachers on how to support wit and wisdom with their students. Um, with our, our trainer at Witten Wisdom, especially designed a training that they're, she's giving tomorrow. To so they got the opening training yesterday, felt some excitement. Tomorrow, they get to go in and ask questions of how their role can support the program. And which which schools do we say we're doing with? Uh, with, with them? So, so that oh, it's all five schools. Um, it's just it's different, different grades. Different grades. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why it's easy to have folks, you know, hear, work with, collaborate, visit their class, share materials. And other folks in the school are doing it, even if they're not yet. I was just wondering about the collaboration of the new school and the new grade. How that would work, but it's by grade level for that. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not going to take you through the next couple slides and read all of the quotes, but um, teachers are generally excited about the program. Yes, they realize that it's taking them extra time to learn and to grow and to figure it out as they go. But just to see how excited the students are about the learning and to see the um, the writing results, I. I can't say enough, honestly. I really can't say enough about the writing. If you um, go forward, one more time, Amy. I'm sorry. Do they have you, you, you just go back. Yeah. They, don't, they don't have it. Oh, okay. If folks can take the chance to read to yourself, um, <laughs> one of, here, here's the middle one on the other page. It was the top one, but it could be any one of but it's the, it's the middle one. Um, <laughs> read anyone, but, but just get a flavor without us reading it to you. Um, and the folks at home, too. I mean, this is just, again, um, you know, let's say I'll say it again. This is not easy to take on for our folks. They're getting a lot of support from their colleagues, you know, their teaching colleagues, their coach colleagues. Um, but they're also really seeing a lot of excitement, not only at home, as Smith said, but but among staff. Um, this is categorically different in terms of student engagement. That's that's we don't have that, you know, you don't have normal stuff. So. Yeah, I mean, I worked in the library many, many sessions with the kids and you could just tell the kids that read a lot from a young age and what they would choose to, to kind of reach for and be engaged in versus the others that weren't as exposed to a lot of the information or interesting topics. Um same kid would go to the same book. So it's kind of work. Just having them exposed and, and learning about real subjects as well as you know all Oh, literacy. That's the issue. Absolutely. And I think the writing too, and we've said this before, but it's so important to reiterate is we would say write more. But the teacher, the students would always say, Well, I don't know what to write about. That is no longer a problem. <laughs> they know exactly what to write about because we are providing that depth of knowledge for them and that vocabulary so they can express. They never run out of ideas. The teachers are actually saying, Okay, they have been writing for days. Can we like shrink this down so we can move on? How do I do that? You know, and that's a real great problem to have. A really great problem yeah. to have. So this was just a couple pieces that I captured um, along the way. I just happened to walk into the kindergarten room and they actually had just created, which it's hard to see in these pictures, their first paragraph. <laughs> and she calls it the um, hamburger bun because at the top, your first bun is your topic sentence and then in the middle is their details. And then your bottom is your conclusion. And they were learning about school long ago and school now. So they were saying they had to make a choice um, if they liked school long ago or school now better. And of course, they all chose now. Um, but they, and then they would talk about things that were different. And they had the microphone, which was the most adorable thing because they had to present and share their paragraph. And the microphone was out here <laughs> and they were talking, um, but it was just so beautiful to see them so engaged again, listening to others, discussing, they read multiple stories about school long ago and now, and then being able to write about it at the kindergarten level in March. Um, so it was really incredible. And then this piece in the middle was a third grader. Um, and you can just see what a difference, you know, <laughs> from the kindergarten. And she was asked to write about a C tool um, from all of the learning that they did. And um, 
that was just a piece. So that's beautiful. And it actually says, and now add an illustration to add to the comprehension of the work. So I think that that is a shift too. Even the language that we're using, add an illustration to add to the comprehension of your writing. Where sometimes it's just to draw a pretty picture and had no connection to what their story was about. And this is just more examples of that. And then this, I just want to end you with um, because it is from a student. This program is so much better than what we did before. We don't just read a story and move on. I like how we are reading the story and all the work we do with it. We are getting deep into the story and doing real meaningful work <laughs> that I love to do. <laughs> Very great. Anything else? Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. And now we're going to hear some about our map. All right. Our update's a little briefer. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot going on this year. Rich Saints, Ms. Burbos. And I'm just trying to be brief. <laughs> Teasing. Um, as you know, we're in our second year of full implementation of Math and Focus, so we'll talk very little about our, our curriculum and more about the other things that we have um, going on. For assessments, we continue to use ENI, which we talked about before, um, which is that one to one, um, administered one to one just with students in kindergarten and first grade, where we're looking for a number identification, sequencing, and applying discrimination. And then for grades one through five, we continue to use the STAR 360, um, which tests the more grade level skills and standards. We use that for the benchmark three times a year and progress monitoring throughout. Um, both ENI and STAR is what we use for data meetings, um, intervention decisions, and our enrichment groups. We also have um, the fact the math and focus chapter test, which we um, use more informally. And um, some schools have been focusing on their chapter test question analysis at their PLCs. Mm -hmm. So we've been doing a little bit of a deeper dive into the alignment of where it falls in the, in the chapter and what teachers can do to make sure they have an adequate exposure to the types of questions. Um, that fluency has become our district's focus, really. We kicked that off this summer with a book study. Um, and then we brought it back to the building level where we developed goals as coach team. We collaborated with other grade level teachers. So they had their goals tied with our goals. And we were doing some that fluency focus through, the, through games, through this book that we read. Um, and then we also had some schools bring this back to the PLC and read, read it through in small teams, um, as well as having teachers just read it on their own to inform their practice. Um, we are pretty excited to share about Do the Math. It's an intervention um, that we are using across all five schools, grades one through five. Um, it comes to 13 modules, and we happen to have all 13 in every building. So we are really excited that we have stocked, stocked all the schools now. Um, and then some schools have been piloting an assessment component for the intervention, and they'll talk about that. Um, a little bit for data. Um, this is ENI, our kindergarten and first grade data is looking really good. Um, you can see we have a side by side analysis from fall to winter. Pretty excited to get to the end of the year so we can show you the, the progress there. Um, but you can see we have currently, or this is actually old data from January, but we had 70% um, meeting expectations at our winter benchmark in kindergarten. Um, and you can see we also moved um, students from yellow and red down and into that green category. Um, and in first grade, we are at 69, so just, just behind kindergarten, again, moving red and yellow. Our goal is 85% for the spring, and I'm feeling very confident that we'll get there. Um, next, you'll see some star data. We have increased green in all grade levels, while also decreasing yellow and red at all grade levels, first, first through third there. And then I think you can quickly see it um, on fourth, fourth and fifth. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
We use star data. Um, we look at it by grade level as a total, which is what you see here. We'll look at it across the, you know, the districts and look like you had said before um, to give us information on the curriculum. And then we'll look at it by homeroom or grade level school-based and then by homeroom. Um, and then we will also dive deeper and look at it at the student level. Um, we use that individual data for child study, student intervention groupings, as well as our enrichment groupings. So not only do we look at it as across the whole grade, but at that individual level. Can I ask a question? Sure. So there's a dramatic change from the early grades to the later grades. Mm -hmm. um, and by fifth grade, so here we start with lots of green. Um, and by fifth grade, um, there's more yellow than green. Yes, I anticipated that you would ask that question. <laughs> so um, I think that I don't want to use this as an excuse. No, that's not. Um, is that I do think that the fifth grade and the fourth grade are still the greatest affected by COVID. So during COVID, um, they did not have that mastery effect fluency that we would look for. They did not have the classroom experience with manipulatives to really understand the, the concepts um, and just that general you know, computation. It, it certainly was affected when we were remote, when we were using more devices. I think that's my, my else wants to. We had discussed that as a team. And that fifth grade class, I believe we decided was the in second grade was when they went COVID hit and yeah, so. they had to go remote. And then third grade was when they were hybrid. And then fourth grade was they came in wearing masks. So that grade level, in our opinion, was hit the hardest. You know, third grade is, is that really heavy shift for. <laughs> right. That's what we, right. That's yeah. That. So yeah. I think that we're, I don't want to say COVID and be, right. you know, I do believe that grade five has had the biggest impact for the students in front of us as we can see grade kindergarten and grade one perhaps that's the least. And this may be beyond what I know anything about, but um, my understanding that a lot of what they're doing now is online. I mean, for instruction? It, well, like uh, practice. I guess that's my question. Are they still? No, no. The curriculum does not have them do much of anything on online. Lots of farm model work, lots of hands-on um, manipulative views uh, at all grade levels. Really? So, so happy numbers mm -hmm. is something that they use to practice at the lower levels, but that's an independent mm -hmm. center. That's just the bulk of it. Yeah, no, that's just like an extra 15 or minute extra practice, whether it's in the classroom. Yeah, cool. So they're doing paper and pen. Yes, their curriculum is all um, paper. I mean, they have multiple workbooks, multiple workbooks, student workbooks, and then extra workbooks. What mm -hmm. well, Math Focus does, we have the platform where it correlates the online student version, correlates with the workbook. So what some teachers might do is have the students show their work in the workbook and then put their answers in on the online platform for assessments. Sorry, yeah, because that will give the, the teacher a deeper analysis on what questions the students are having errors with. And then they go back to the workbook to see the work itself. And we showed you some of those reports that we were able to get last time mm -hmm. if they were to take their assessments online. But their data to day classwork is not online at all. Great. Thank you. So this is some examples of that fluency games from the book that we had discussed that the math coaches did a book study on this summer. Um, the purpose of this was for low stress practice of facts and strategies, um, think alouds, listening to peers, discussing strategies. We know that now, sorry, I just mixed up my slides here. We know that research says now that time tests are not the way to go for mastering facts. It should be hands-on, understanding the concept, making those connections from one fact to the other. So these games are where we like to gear towards more, and that's the route that we're going. Um, the games are introduced to school at the schools, and then some of us send the games home to play with siblings, with parents. Um, teachers can observe the students instead of giving the time tests, and then they can ask questions about their accuracy. Um, it gives teachers the opportunity to ask questions, how did you get that answer? Instead of just having the students write their answers out and calling it a day. Um, it also gives the opportunity for differentiation within the games. You might have some students that are trying to master their plus one facts 
where other students are ready for their combinations of 10. So you'll see a lot of differentiation in the classrooms within that. It gives us a chance to enrich our students and also work with our students that are struggling. And the observation tools, like I said, allow for more communication between student and teacher and really understanding and getting a strong idea of where the students are at within their facts. And this is what I was talking about when we said we set goals for the school of classroom teachers. We had different grade levels. It was like grade one and two, I think we partnered with most. And as coaches, we've been able to assess students one to one to really dig deeper and to know individual students' expertise and their strategies. We had those one to one conversations where we weren't timing them, but then we could say, hey, "What's what you're thinking? How did you figure that out?" And that's how we determined which games and what they would be put into. Yes, those interview tools that um, the previous slide. The, the interview tool is um, excellent for whether the coach or the teacher administers it in that one-to-one -one setting, low stress, as they mentioned, and gives us that information as opposed to that kill and drill type of thing. And then also as um, the next one is just a uh, teacher, second grade teacher who took the book study, really ran with it and felt strongly implemented it this year. And we've been working together and she feels you know, that this was very different from the way she learned her math facts um, and how it helps build their confidence, um, which does impact their entire uh, math experience. And um, these are those foundational skills that they're gonna carry with them, building blocks throughout um, their experience. And at the bottom there, it's just a quick chart showing how the program helps build their foundational facts, which we do with the Math and Focus program also. So nicely aligned. And the order is not that natural, like that one, two, three, four, five. Exactly. exactly. So you start with that plus and minus um, zero, one, two. And then once they've, they call them foundational facts, once they've mastered those, then they go to the derived facts, which would be more like near doubles and doubling. Um, so the other thing that Kristen had mentioned was um, uh, the do the math intervention that we now have at all the schools. Um, it's very hands-on, a lot of manipulatives. Um, in, interwoven is games, which keeps the children's attention as well. Um, there's progress monitoring in there. The assessment tools are fantastic because it gives them a pre and a post that some of us are piloting. Um, and it really dissects where the need is and where their strengths are. Um, Mindy will go in more into that. But um, and then along the way, within each module, our little show what you know type of uh, progress monitors along the way to make sure they're making that effective progress. Um, we have used it last year at the summer learning program, and we plan to use do the math again this summer as well. Um, and it engages, engages students with a hands-on learning experience. There's a lot of uh, talking about their math, talking about their learning uh, and routines as well as an independent piece included. Speaking on behalf of this, I actually had a student um, a couple of weeks ago where we put the student in the intervention and the student's progress monitoring didn't show much growth. So I pulled the student aside because the teacher says, I'm really concerned. He shows more in the classroom than what he's showing on the STAR assessment. So I pulled him aside and I said, can you explain to me, you know, how does STAR go? What's going on? And he's flat out third grader said, well, I know if I do good on that STAR, I'm not going to get to do my math intervention anymore. And I really like the <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, okay, touche, you are. <laughs> so we had to then figure out how can we implement do the um, this intervention in the classroom? So then the teacher holds the intervention and is not using it as an intervention. She's using it as a supplemental for her teacher table so more kids could get that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he still got it. And shocker, his scores skyrocketed. <laughs> I had a third grade teacher do the fraction component as, a, as an intervention. And she said, wow, this is great. This really should be the introduction to third grade curriculum. And so she did and took it and was doing it station based. And that is the beauty of this type of program. It, it isn't just solely to be used as an intervention. Teachers can use this also in their classroom to drive instruction.
All right, so um, some of the schools are piloting the digital component um, of the assessments. And so you have two reports here. On the left side, you see an individual student progress report. Um, as Jenny said, students take a beginning, sometimes a middle and an end of module assessment after every 15 lessons or so. There's 30 lessons in each module. And then on the right, you see um, a group grading report. And so um, you can see the progress at the, at the time of this meeting, student have, these students have only taken the beginning and middle um, assessments. And so that's the, the two bars you see on the left. And so um, for the whole group, we can see how the students did overall. You see the assessment scores on the right, but then it breaks it down into the various components. So just like reading, we're getting more specific details about the skills and concepts where they're struggling or they have strengths. So we've used these reports um, in data meetings um, to evaluate student progress and to know if they're in the right group or not. We've um, sometimes moved a student to a different group, whether they needed a higher level um, or they needed more, uh, more intensity of services going at a slower pace. Or in some cases, we've moved them back to tier one instruction and they don't need the group. It's also been really helpful at child study team meetings when we're um, talking about students progress in those tier two interventions and um, what to do next with that student. Um, so it's been really helpful even within the same program. You, you can see here students have different areas where the struggle is. So whether it's word problems, oh, I know with that student, I need to really focus my instruction on the, in this program on the word problems, whereas, oh, three of those students have a real strength in that area. So we can still differentiate within the program. And last but not least, this is what I like to call the fun stuff. Um, the coaches and the math leaders right now are currently working on family engagement projects. The curriculum review that we had, um, we have teachers come and meet and discuss how things are going at their building in the math world any humps that they're in problems that they're coming across, anything that they're having aha moments with. So it's a great way for the schools to collaborate and make sure that we're all on the same page. Because like Melissa said, with literacy, if a student goes from one school to the other, we want to make sure that that's a smooth transition, not only socially for the child, but academically as well. So that helps us all stay on the same page. Um, and then we, those meetings are um, five teachers, one from each building representing their team. So West Parish would send one grade one teacher to represent grade one. So there'd be five first grade teachers there representing decisions on about first grade. And we did that twice this year. We had one already and we're doing one at the end of the year. And it's the same representative for both. Um, and they, they're collecting information over the course of the year, note taking, keeping track of their pacing so that they can come and report you know, adjustments and suggestions that they can make at their particular grade level and they represent the whole team. It was a great collaborative effort. You have one yeah. teacher that said, you know, my students I noticed are really struggling with fractions. So another teacher said, oh, did you try X, Y, and Z? And they went back and tried the strategy and then they'll come back to the table again and say if that worked for them or if they need any more support. Um, and also we had asked fourth grade teachers what would you like to see the third grade teachers work on a little bit more? And then we asked third grade, what would you like the second grade teachers to work on a little bit more? So we did that, that as well. We um, scheduled the, the grade levels so that we had the information to pass on to the next one. So we can strategically plan them to have that information to pass down to the grade. And, you know, of course, sometimes you see the teachers say, oh, of course I taught that last year. And of course they were exposed to that. And then other times they really get that aha moment. And it's nice to see the grade levels, they're starting to really understand why, what the expectation is for the one grade and why it needs to be taught explicitly for the next grade for true understanding. And then of course we have our math-based theme days that us as coaches decided to take on. We wanted to do more engaging activities for the students on specific days. So you saw the pie day picture. Um, we've also did the hundredth day. Here you see there was a backdrop and students had props that they could celebrate the 100th day. Um, we also have a scavenger hunt that was put around some of the schools. So this is a group of kindergartners that had to go around the building and find the letter K for their grade level and then pull it up. And there was a question. Within those questions, we tried to put in kinesthetic movement. We tried to put in math talks to support that end of it. 
And then I even saw at my building, some third graders were looking for fourth grade material and they were pulling it up and working on that together. Or some fourth graders were pulling up second grade material. You know, you had your ELL students working with your English speaking students and different grade levels working together. Um, I had a fifth grader and a, kin and a kindergartner walking around the building together trying to find the letters. And then we also are doing stuff for Red Sox opening day. And I think those are our only different buildings. Yeah, different buildings for different holidays. Um, first year, just moment saying which school and teacher you are at. Sorry, East Gloucester. Home Cove. Home Cove. Beeman. West Parish. East Gloucester and Veterans. Well, thank you. My question is, <clears throat> as, as this whole group is talking, I can't help but sort of think about the difference in um, our teaching models, like some platoon, some don't. I don't know what the word is, but what? It's not platoon. <laughs> has, but, but, yeah, because they're the yeah. age all. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I guess I'm curious, do you notice a difference in a teacher's bandwidth to access all of this that you're talking about for those who platoon and those who teach all of it? And that's a really big question, but it seems like this is a lot for a teacher to access, you know, just one teacher. <laughs> I, can, I can only speak to East Gloucester and say that platooning is the best thing to be ever did. Yeah. Um, but I can't speak to say like if it's not working the other way because this is all we know now for mm -hmm. grades one through five and it works really well. But I, I think that it depends on the teacher mm -hmm. and I think that it depends on the expectation, you know, and I think that it depends on the students. Some years you're going to have students that might benefit more from platooning, but another year you might have students that benefit more from being in the classroom with one teacher and creating that bond with that one teacher. So. It's a hard call. There's pros and cons to both. I agree with that. There are pros and cons to both. I've done both personally. I finished my classroom career as a platooner, and I would not have ever gone back to teaching at all. But that's a personal thing. The one thing to keep in mind is that, is that if you're doing all subjects, you have half, you know, half number of students. You know, you know. So I mean, that, again, that's sort of it's a balancing or mitigating force. If you're doing it, you know, all this. For you know, for both for you know, for all you know, numerous classes, um, it can be more formal, but you have to you know, your students to face um, you know, on, on the key you know math or you know. Like, you so know so it's a personal preference. Some people just really love to have their mm -hmm. yeah. And which remind me of which school for doing which ones don't. It's not really like identified as like a whole school. Like, yeah, because you know, for example, like when you have when you have beam and that beam or, or, or for West Parish are three um, homerooms, you know, three seconds at, at, a, at a, it's not a, it's not an easy uh, um, a platoon, you know. So you might have some some that do in a grade, some that don't. Okay, because you have to have two classes of platoon. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So so that's why it's not just you know all schools are not. But I mean there there are a couple schools that do it completely. Because K one is self contained, and then two to five is yeah. But two East Gloucester's been one to five for many many years, mm -hmm. longer than I get over. Mm -hmm. um, so two to from one to five, um, mm -hmm. and East Bex is going to be taking the model for, of one to five for two. Um, but it really is a personal, not a personal. It's a it's a decision and you made at a, at each building level. Um, what works in the building. When you have three of a, a grade level, it's harder to platoon. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not always as equitable um, as far as splitting up the day um, into different chunks. So it it's really depends on what works within the building and they, or even sometimes a grade level. Yeah. Sometimes there's a class that it just really makes sense with and a principal or the staff might make that decision. Um, but, yeah. And I think that's the beauty of our role too. You know, that's kind of our job is to hone in on our specific content and help teachers. You know, the math teacher that platoons might not need as much support as the math teacher that as the teacher that teaches it all. You know, yeah. sometimes a platooning math teacher just wants someone to talk to and bounce ideas off with because they may not have that partner next door. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is one of the 
exciting things I think about East Gloucester and Betts coming together next year is we will finally have a grade level partner um, for the literacy so that they actually have someone other than me to chat about curriculum <laughs> <laughs> with. Fun. Not that I'm not excited about it. <laughs> but it is nice that they will have a partner in their um, subject area. That they'll, they'll have a teammate and they'll have a content partner. Okay, cool. So it's okay. exciting to see that coming together for four teachers in the same grade level. It'll be interesting to see how it all plays out, but it's really exciting to see it. And so that's like the pros and cons here. Like you would, what parish might have three teachers that they all coordinate together. Yeah, for they, they have a buddy to say, wow, that like lesson that. really yeah, yeah, was yeah. hard. Yeah. What did you do? What can I do? You know, whereas Eddie's Gloucester, if you're teaching one grade, math, you're the only, there's nobody to talk to other than math, right? Yeah. Other elementary school. Yeah, they'll yeah. elaborate when they yeah. can, but oh, on yeah. the day to day, yeah. it's trickier. Like a common planning time at West Parish would be a team of maybe the three classroom teachers, the coaches, and you know, just make the special ed teacher where it's a common planning time to say, you cluster, you might just be stuck with us. <laughs> right. But the, the wonderful thing about the blue tuning is they'll always say, come visit me in the afternoon because they've already done it once. So they feel <laughs> yes. like master in right. the afternoon, right. you know, like, hey, this is my second time through this. I know how to tweak and change it. So it's almost like they get two years of practice in one year's time. Yes. So they really become experts experts of the programs. Yes. Right. And what's just as exciting is that we do this with all you coaches. Because there was a time we didn't have any coaches here. So well, with while well, there's excitement with platooning, I sit here as a school committee member excited about coaches. Thank so you. Thank you. I see the great presentation. Disappointing. Yes. Question. Question and then just a quick couple of comments. One is uh I, I sometimes get concerned about the amount of testing and monitoring, like you know, that's, that's a lot of that goes on, mm -hmm. you know, and kind of, I think that the opportunity to kind of lose that one-on-one -on -one connection that a lot of students need. Uh, do you sense that at all, or is that just Part and parcel of what we're doing now. There's a lot of testing, a lot of monitoring, a lot of measuring. I think we're getting better at it. Mm -hmm. So we are spending less time doing it, but finding out more information. And that's exactly like the platform that we're talking about. We're able to find out valuable information without having to spend oodles and oodles of time doing it. Um, so I think that we're doing a better job with less time with fewer assessments. And that's like our fact fluency piece as well. Teachers are walking around with their observation tool, yeah. which is a piece of paper, and they have no idea they're even being informed. Yeah. Just coming mm -hmm. in their head, okay, but that's that, yeah. within a number of you know, seconds, where the students are like, oh, it's not stop on watch. Right. Yeah. They're playing a game, and the teacher's listening to their conversation, but at the same time, assessing what the conversation is. And right. asking specific questions, or and that, and there is that intimacy when you have that interview type of experience as opposed to start and try to answer 20 questions that's high stress also and that's also one reason why we've been trying that pilot for the data math where we may be able to do some progress monitoring in a small group of five or six and maybe remove a month's worth of a star perhaps say the example could be like let's remove february's because we we're, we're going to be Progress on just those six students that are in that group. We don't need to progress on the 20 students in the classroom. Yeah. The second the one is, is, is on. You know, for example, the M class, that's a that's paper and pencil for the student, but it's being recorded digitally by the by the coaches and others. And so we can get that access to that data. That's one piece, is it isn't all it looks digital, but isn't all digital for the students, first of all. But the other piece on assessment is crucial is is purposeful. You know, and, and if it's if we're doing to do it or we're doing a lot of it, we're not getting something that getting information that helps us, you know, then in, um, intervene or support or teach or, try, or teach better, then that's a problem. Yeah. But it's purposeful and, and we know also how we're using the data, then it's value. Yeah. Otherwise you're just doing to keep on weighing, you know, measuring it. Yeah, and I look at it constantly as like it makes that one on one that face the face time. Because we just know each student better. Absolutely. My, my second question is more geared towards uh, maybe kids that are on an IEP, especially, you know, kids that are involved in special ed. Um, one of the things that's important to me is that uh, that kids, it seems like this is a good tool, and I think as teachers, obviously dedicated teachers, that 
you're aware of this, but that we're recognizing those kids that are improving and kind of building them up and saying, you know, in a perfect world, you know, parents are involved, they want to see the job. That's not the reality. It's a lot of parents that are disconnected from what their kids are doing in school. And for whatever reason, it's just not a priority for them. And I think that you people are the only conduit for those kids that can really kind of build them up and say, you know, he's pretty good at math, so stick with it. Um, so just any comments on that? I mean, parents kind of, I, I, I sometimes, especially with special ed kids, they're not general broad brush statement, they're maybe not as involved or as, you know, invested in that. And I just think it's important that the teachers that are doing all this work kind of, kind of promote those kids and let them know, hey, pretty good at this, so. Well, the star assessment for math specifically, and I believe reading does as well, shows a growth report. So we don't always focus on if they're going to reach benchmark because they may not, they might be a special ed student, but we want to make sure they're making growth. Right. So that's a, a big part of our assessments as well is, is the growth there. Yeah. And they may be from red to yellow or stay mm -hmm. within yellow, but where they make the expected growth. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's a celebration that can happen between the teacher or the coach and the student. Yeah. They can say, look, you have grown this far this right. year, you know, really fill them up. Right. But and I can say we witness it every day. Yeah. If there's sure. I mean, connections I'm and sure. celebrations within each and every classroom, yeah. we have some really amazing teachers and staff who build those. I mean, truly their only purpose in the day is to make sure that the children know that we want them there yeah. and we're happy they're there. and. We expect them to learn while they're there. Yeah, right. And you know, we set those high expectations and we want them to reach it. We know that they can. Yeah. Last thing for me is just a comment on uh, the work that you do. I love to watch people that are really good at what they do and, and <laughs> dedicated to it. So um, we're glad you guys showed up today. <laughs> 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 we were coming slide by slide and we were it's just so I'm, I'm literally your biggest cheerleader. Right? <laughs> Whenever I talk about the public schools plus, I say we do such a great job with wit and wisdom and math literacy and people involved in that. Um, it is just some impressive stuff. If people want to question well, where, where are the lost public schools, start with this and then build off of that because that really uh, it's it's I don't think I could be any more to it. Despite the fact that I think every every fraction strategy was probably used with me, and I continue to say, "I'm the hamburger bun analogy might help me." Uh, I don't think you could do that. Well, probably first. because you were taught just not the strategies, but you were a process. Yeah. yeah. So you have to memorize the process and grow. It's going to make money to your parents. Yeah. <laughs> Therein lies the problem. I got a text from my friend this morning who was the first, her children are in first grade too, and she said, please help. Yeah. <laughs> simply couldn't be any more impressed with you. That's it. So, uh, it's always hard to go after Bill. <laughs> <laughs> um, but two things. One, just from my personal experience, sometimes the um, the assessments are met with one on one. Yeah. So, like, teachers go one on one with the teacher. So, that's, I mean, that's, it's not how it sounds, but as a parent, I know that you guys and the teachers you work with meet and talk to students. So, it's not all digital, even though it sounds yeah. digital. I don't know if that makes sense, mm -hmm. but uh, I experienced that and appreciate it deeply. Um, the other question is the, um, the tool that you um, the, that you use for interventions, but that can be used in classrooms. I mean, that sounds pretty cool. Is there a way to sort of introduce, it sounds like one of those fun, when I was a kid, we had these fun enrichment boxes. So I think I saw a picture of that box. It's like, oh, those things. Is there a way that, I don't know if all teachers know that those are accessible to them in their classrooms, but it sounds like it's a good, good tool that's there. I know. I know you've already thought of this, so I'm not introducing anything. I know Brandon. I think it's being thoughtful of when and where to do that. Like the third grade fractions, for example, is a great time to bring that, do the math in because it's one spot in the curriculum where they want to go. The teachers, because of the math review, 
All right. Yeah. Said they wanted a little bit of it, a boost to get them ready for the primer, and they're and they're implementing it. So it it definitely can be and will be as needed. Some of it's new to us. Right? Yeah. So we're, we're that's really good at working through all of the modules and for certain some of the interventions we're doing them will report back to us, and that's how that that example from fractions worked. It was. A teacher who reported back and we, we did that. Um, same with other interventionists where they can say this game was really successful. Students really, you know, understood combinations of 10 of this game. And then they can say, let's take that game to the classroom. So it's as we experience and use all of the different components that we will be able to know which ones might be best you know, for all students to experience. And like I said, we just got all of the modules. Mm -hmm. I think this year finally about the school, they've just been you know, the last two years stuck, stuck in the front of them. There you go. And I think that speaks on behalf of our common planning times as well. Mm -hmm. That gives the teachers the opportunity to say to the coaches, my student or this group might be struggling with this concept. And that's when I can say, oh, I have a do the math module that will help with that. And that's when I can give it out as well. But I have teachers, one teacher used it specifically in second grade last year. And she came to me in June and she said, I know you're going to ask for this back. I don't want to give it back and I want to claim it in September. I said, well, you can't claim it now, but sure, we can chat about it when the time comes. So as the teachers start to use it more and they start talking in the teacher's room and then they say, oh, why did she get the nine-sided dice with this specific game? I want that too. And something else is that the special ed teachers that are doing co-teaching, um, say our veterans, they're also using some of this with their, their small group pull-out students and or can bring that back into the classroom. So as they continue to use it, they can, they'll be able to see the connection of, okay, this worked in my you know, small group and I can take this back into the classroom and share this with my you know, great little partners as well. So hopefully over time and experience that will grow. It just sounds like, I mean, I have heard in other contexts that the intervention groups are really fun, right? <laughs> so, you know, fun in a, is good. I'll have to tell my interventionist to take it down and not. <laughs> Diving on the test of the game. I will, I will speak to one more thing, which is that sometimes I love to have those one time conferences with students and other teachers at the buildings that I work as, as, as coaches to have those one to one conferences with kids um, to be a motivator. So we do show those reports, they create friend lines. And they love to see their own arrow and their trend line. So we do often share those reports. Not every class, not every grade, but um, teachers who are familiar with with it uh, have asked us and or themselves they share with kids. And then students will be like, I'm like, yeah, can we show me? Can you pull it up for me? And then they're just trying to be great keep themselves really or keep their arrow going. I just want to follow on what you said. Um, you know. That's just probably one of the biggest, most important investments that we've made because I just remember years ago trying to figure out the time I worked to figure out how our interests were terrible, right? And um, this is just so much more important than figuring out that test. This is what you know should be being taught against the standards and against what kids can do, really taking it to a human level, which is really, you know, from a from my perspective, the most important thing is that kids know you care and that they're learning. And, and these pieces of, of how you learn the LA, you know, most parents have no concept, right? And when you get learned, you just either learn the routine to, you know, figure out how to divide something or whatever. Um, but there's just so much more um, breadth of information that can help kids master and really understand how it's used, which is the most important thing as they continue going through the grades. So it really was probably one of our biggest, most investments. important investments. And I'm sorry it took so long to get math coaches up to the scale because um, we clearly got ELA up to the scale sooner, but, um, but we knew how important. And just having teachers here with us, with the enthusiasm is, is to me priceless just to have you know, people that truly care about kids, but also care about like the real materials that that we're using um, that make a difference. So. And math is fun. I was always a math. <laughs> and, you know, we make math a game. I mean, it's something like these kids, you know, really, that's the way you get kids to practice. It's not homework here, but you can go home and play this game. And get good at it. So yeah, it just reinforces, you know, for me, math is all practice, practice, practice. It's not... 
So we should be asking, do you have any games tonight? Not do any <laughs> <laughs> right? Change the whole. Thank you for such a fabulous, mm -hmm. um, informative presentation. This, this is really what we hope people will watch our meetings, even if they don't plug in at the same time. But you know, tell your friends you gave. We will tell our friends you gave a great presentation. We always, um, you know, school committee members, people don't know that these are kind of the most uh, powerful things we listen to and consider. And, and our budget, you know, everything, this is stays in the budget. It's not, you know, not even an issue or a question anymore as to what um, we can afford it. It's, you know, what else do we not need, but this is what we need. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good night. We will move on to subcommittee reports, and we have one meeting the building and finance subcommittee meeting of March 15th. And Chairperson Melissa and Sarah Prince will thank you. So on March 15th, the full building finance subcommittee met. Um, we got a report for health insurance. The numbers came in from GIC, which usually come in around the first week of March, a little bit later this year. Um, the cost of the plans changed. Um, there was some increases. Um, and then there was some decreases in some plans. So the highest increase was 11.5%. And there was a few plans that decreased about approximately 0.5% as well. Overall, the average, this is gonna get confusing because I'm talking about numbers. Overall, the average is about 6.24 and that's about the amount that we budgeted. So bottom line, we're, we're in the good. Um, Tufts and Harvard Pilgrim merged and it's those two plans that the cost decreased. Um, always rebranded, and they are now called Mass General Brigham. Um, they're, they had an increase of approximately 6.5%. Um, many of our employees are scattered between the um, Harvard Pilgrim and Tufts. That's the one that merged. Um, so a lot of the costs went down because they were on those plans. Um, but overall, we're in good shape because we did budget and um, I think we budgeted 7%, it came out to an average of 6%. So while there are a small number of employees that the cost went up, there's also employees that it went down. So the average came out um, to what we had planned originally. So that's good news. Um, for a budget update, we discussed increases in out-of-district tuition for 2023 um, with a predicted higher forecast for fiscal year 2024. As we know, all the cost of um, doing business is going up. Um, out, of, out of district transportation had an increase of approximately $648,000, um, projected to be much higher in fiscal year 2024. So when we were discussing earlier about costs, um, that is something we have to keep our eye on. Special ed education for fiscal year 2024 is gonna be approximately $4.5 million of our budget. Um, we do have a plan to pay that down using Repaid tuition that we see um, at the end of the year. On um, circuit breaker money, we do have a contingency account. Um, but overall, there'll be an increase of over a million dollars as we proceed into 2024. Those costs are going up. Um, we discussed the ESSER budget. As you remember, when we got that funding, we kept a separate budget. Um, expenditures went to salaries and stipends, um, pension, Medicare contract services, curriculum, playgrounds. Um, I think we should be proud of the fact that the funds were used responsibly and they were managed very well by the administration, which I can't say enough about um, because we were able to achieve our goals um, to have positive student impacts with that 
funding that's coming from um, the federal government. We did some budget transfers. Um, as you know, anything over $8,000, we have to approve. Um, so we had some transfers from food costs um, to pay for the increase of food that's going up and also some out of district transportation costs. Um, we talked about the auditorium feasibility study. As you know, last meeting, we were gonna accept a grant for $25,000 from the Gloss Red Foundation, which would um, put us in a position to match and then increase $50,000 out of our own budget. We referred it to BNF for further discussion. We got a good discussion from administration with some documents. Um, we discussed the conditions of the O'Malley in the high school auditorium. Um, it was also mentioned that the administration is in discussions with the DPW about the issues of the auditorium as well. Um, issues like broken seats, the where lighting is dim and not strong enough. Um, our sound systems are old, the technology is old, some not repairable. Um, we have to address some storage matters and also some privacy and changing issues are um, can be looked at as well. Um, so the study will provide and review, review and provide an assessment for architectural designs, mechanical engineering, acoustic and lighting, and structural and engineering costs um, for both those auditoriums. Um, so we did take a vote on that, which I believe we're going to address tonight as well. Um, we started to have a conversation about alcohol on school grounds. I believe it's in October, the Gloucester 400 would like to use one of our schools um, to do a function and they've asked to serve alcohol. We really didn't have enough information, so we referred that to a future meeting where we're gonna have that group come in and tell us exactly what type of function it's gonna be. Are they gonna be kids? Is it a family event? Is it not a family event? So that we can make a better decision on um, how we wanna proceed in their request to allow alcohol on school grounds. And then we discuss the building use agreement. We have our Girl Scouts um, who have requested to waive their fee, which I believe was about $675. If you remember when we did the building use um, policy, we put in language that if someone felt they needed assistance in paying that they could reach out to us and they did. Um, this is a group that did not pay building use last year and this year they got a bill, um, but with the agreement of the DPW, um, which is also a motion for us to discuss tonight, we um, are agreeing that they do not pay um, for the building use for the 18 dates that they use a one classroom. Um, they do still have to pay the particular application fee, but um, the subcommittee is going to recommend that we do not charge them for using the platforms. So and they, yeah, they don't they don't collect fees, right? right. They, they don't have a revenue stream. Yeah like some groups do to um, raise money with the federal classrooms. Um, so with that being said, I do you want to move on to the action items? Sure. So the um, building finance subcommittee unanimously voted to motion. Where is it on here? I don't even see it on here. The the um auditorium one. Except for the you're accepting the grant. It's really oh, number three over here. Okay. Um, the we we voted unanimously and recommended the full school committee that the Gloucester Education Foundation grant in the amount of twenty five thousand dollars for a feasibility study of the Gloucester High School in the O'Neill Auditorium be accepted. And I move. Second. Um, discussion. report. No questions. Excellent. Uh, may we vote, Maria, please? Mr. Melvin? Yes. Mr. Minion? Yes. Ms. Prince? Yes. Mayor Burnham? Yes. Ms. Watson? Yes. Ms. Wieson? Yeah. Chairperson Clancy? Yes. In addition, the Building and Finance Subcommittee unanimously voted to approve the waiver of building use fees for the Girl Scouts, and I still move. Second. Yes. I have a question. Go ahead, Laura. Um, so there's a number of Girl Scout troops in this city. Um, and I'm just wondering if they, um, I don't know how many, but I'm wondering if this is a privilege that would be given to all of them. Well, can I just, so um, 
So if anybody can finish that. Um, so something that as, as the building BNF subcommittee has worked through this and obviously you know, a number of, number of pieces and parts, um, something I've been very clear about is I don't want to create exceptions for individual organizations. We need to create rates for uh, classes of organizations. Okay, so the one that that we're creating now, okay, is for youth serving organizations. So we already have a different fee code for youth serving organizations, but this is for ones that don't charge any um, fees. Like they don't have they're not charging fees for participation for their group. So the Girl Scouts is an example of that, but there may be others. Okay? Well, Girl Scouts of America of Eastern Massachusetts does charge. I mean, any so I'm not an expert, but Girl Scouts of Eastern Massachusetts is part of Girl Scouts of America, and they do. But are are the, are the troops charging the participants? I think what they charge is like minimal, and it covers the cost of like the badges and things like that. I don't, I wouldn't say yeah, no, that I didn't say they would be the based on yeah. cost to run their program. Right, no. it's more or less on fee. Hundred percent. The Girl Scouts of America is very wealthy organization. Right, no, no, it's not. No, no, but it's a lot of cookies out of it. That doesn't go to the troops. Right, I know that. Right. Um, yes, no, yeah, yeah, yes. So, but I'm just playing devil's advocate a little bit here because. We have a number of troops in the city. Um, so it's not a specific troop. Mm -hmm. this, well, in, this fact, in fact, I guess I might, might even say that this is actually worded incorrectly because as, as the as the PNF, if we voted, it was for you serving or organizations that don't charge a fee. Yeah. Okay. That that's what we should be voting on, right? Yeah. Not cross counts. That's the new category. Right. That's right. new category because we have you know, the other other category that that since since the original vote. On the uh, change in the, the building use policy procedures, we had one other change and that was for, for these high use organizations, two serving high use organizations. Okay, um, so so that's a, that's a class we created. Now this used to be a second another class, which is you know, use serving that don't charge user fees, basically. Right. You know, or towards not or towards nominal ones. Okay, um, because I I can't have another organization come. You know that's you serving, but it you know and said, it, but they got a deal. I need it. I'm not. I'm, I'm not going on that. Road. No, no, of course, and that's why I'm asking the specific question because this specific organization has. Yeah. You know, they, I think they would all fall under the same category, right? So that's my question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. that's with that the category is a youth serving organization that has no revenue stream. Right, right. That fall, all of those troops would fall into that category. So then, for use of. So I just want to be clear that we didn't have, this is a new discussion. We didn't really go this far at BNF. We focused on the Girl Scouts so, no, and no. talked about how they would charge $675 for their fee and they didn't pay last year. And that's the documentation we got. I didn't, I didn't my takeaway wasn't that this was a, a bigger ask. Not that I wouldn't agree with it, but I just want to be clear with that. No, I, 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 I'd like to show you Show the committee rather. Okay, what we shared at the committee. Eighteen beats Girl Scouts. So, 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 one. Waiver no fee collected youth organizations. We're using the Girl Scouts as example. That's the only organization we have that fits in this category right now. Okay. The only group that uses this. Um, uh, you know, that fits in this category. So then the issue is the motion that came out of that discussion was about the Girl Scouts, not about the waiver for the no fee collected. So we be about the new category. Yeah, it should have been. That, that, that was the only thing. So, I, you know, I, yep. I probably wasn't paying attention when the motion was made, honestly. I should have caught it. Um, but but the attention is not for Girl Scouts, it's for these no for fee collected. Category. Yes. And then that's why I titled it very purposely this way, you know, um, I changed that when Gary first brought it to me. Um, because it, again, it's not about the organization, it's about class organizations. So we'll probably have to do, we have to approve the motion that came out, I mean, or not approve it, one or the other. Amend, or, amend the, I think it's it's pretty easy just to, you could withdraw it. Withdraw it. Make it, make motion based on the uh, heading on there. Yeah. Instead of doing amendments, because you have to vote on the right, amendment, yeah, vote on the original exactly, motion. Yeah. So you as the motion maker, you say withdraw the motion. 
Right. I guess so. I so I'll do that. I'll withdraw the motion, and based on the conversation we have, we had. I believe would support the language of the new motion coming out over it. So I would say that, which I don't know what that motion would be. I guess the motion, well, we have to vote on the withdrawal, right? Who seconded that? Oh, you, no, vote. you don't no, vote. You to when I withdraw it, someone has to agree to withdraw the second. No? Well, you just vote no on your oh, motion right. and start all over. Basically. <laughs> so, I, I think the least confusing thing is that I'm going to vote no on your motion. Right. And then after no, so I would just withdraw the motion, but I thought you had to do something right. in a second. I don't have my Robert's rule cheat sheet for putting it. So. But anyway, okay, so the motion is withdrawn. Right. So I guess the motion is that we will. Before you make a motion, can I ask yep. a question? So I just want to be sure about the language. So we went from no fee to nominal fee. So can you go back to that? This says no fee. The no fee. Yeah. Okay. Just the fifty dollars application fee. No, no, she's no, no, asking in terms about of what the what the organization. organization charges its its participants. Oh, I see what you say. So just to be clear, so I, we didn't I, have I, that I, expression. I, to be accurate, yeah. So the let me ask you this then, because I would have asked you the other night if I had understood it better. Um, how are you categorizing the groups that we? Intend to waive their fee. So I don't intend to waive the fee of any group unless they fall into this category. Right. Okay. So who falls under this category? What is during BNF? It was no fees. No. So so I don't know how to do nominal fees. I have to think more about that. But it was when you say no fee. What do you mean by no fee? That I was I was under the impression yeah. or understanding. I should say I, what I understood was that Girl Scout specifically. Don't charge a fee. A rental fee? A user fee. A user fee. Okay. And so in order to create, so we have to, I want to create, create any uh, treat rather, any user organization in that same boat the same way. Right. Okay. No, I get that. Yeah. You're so so, so yeah. for me, the category was uh user organization that don't charge a fee to users. So you mean uh, you if know, I sign up, I don't pay any fee to belong to the group. That's right. Because thought. if that's yeah. the case, I don't know that the Girl Scouts fall into that category. Right. We have to have, I right. think have to look. I'm not trying to make it difficult. No. I just want to. How sensitive is this? Do we have it? I mean. No, we can. We can go back to this. Yeah, we should probably go back. So instead of us guessing here. Yeah. yeah. Well, exactly. What, what about Laura's word of nominal? I mean, to me. Well, that, but then we have to define nominal. Is it under $100 or over $100? Right. right? right. We yes. don't have time to do that right now. I didn't mean to. We just have to find no, out. We've got a number of groups. Yeah. The number of groups. In the city, that but do they use our building? I think the other aspect of, of our discussions had to do with that it's using one classroom. So, and during school hours, there were just you know I think if you know I hate to have some youth organization form and say oh look, we want to use your every day we want to use your gym right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, again, this is also this is multi-use, folks. I mean, if, if, if any organization wants to use it one time, you know, we have to charge them. And that's not very, it's not a lot of money. Okay, um, remember, none of our fees for user and organizers are are are, are pricey. Right. Okay. okay. Um, so, I, I don't know. this is the girl. The Girl Scouts we use as an example, and they use a classroom twice a month for nine months out of the year. They do it right after school, so the custodians are still there, so there's not a, a cost to that. So in that example is why we agreed to waive the building use fee. I don't know that we're prepared to do the work to find out every group in Gloucester and go out and invite them and say they could use our school. So but, but we would have to. We don't need to because we can look at what groups have been using our, our buildings. Because I think for I mean, multiple you, use. I think yeah. Girl Scouts are the one or the only group right now that in this oh, category that has been using it. So I mean that's why we want to give you one example. I think that, so. Know. Maybe we can do two things. Maybe we can send it back to BNF to discuss what the category is going to be and what the conditions of that category are. And at the same time, let's waive fees for the Girl Scouts. Right. So back. To so back. Motion. I'm gonna put my motion back on the table. Right. <laughs> Just so we can deal with the Girl Scouts that are using the building right now that use it regularly. It's about people I, who use I, it regularly. But wait, isn't? I so would just advise a, you against voting okay. for okay. a fee for waiving a fee for a specific organization 
because then any other can, can right. come to you and, and, and petition you for the same exact treatment. But didn't, isn't that part of our new policy that they can ask He's for creating. a waiver? It is. It's, well, for financial. That's what I'm saying. Right. So and that's what they've done. That's that how that I took this there. as a, that motion. So right now, any organization can ask for a waiver. Right. And so it seems to me that it's a, a case by case basis based on this policy anyway. Right. And that's what I thought we were doing, to be honest with you. I didn't understand what we Well, I that. think it's important that we do have sort of a, a a group that we don't charge for. It feels like we're going to have to take this case by case anyway, because our policy says that any group can ask for a waiver. Mm -hmm. No, but Ben wanted to come up with a policy <laughs> where the groups that fall under this category wouldn't have to ask for that waiver. Right. So that's the ultimate goal is for having a policy that is consistent. So, but any other group could still. They could, but they may not fall under these criteria. They'd ask out of a different reason. But there's no rush on this. A revisit by being an would make sense. So I want to be clear. So it's going back to BNF to create a new group. And we have to figure out how we distinguish that group to be a non fee nominal fee group. Right? Sounds like it's already been created. Well, that's what I'm trying to figure out what we're doing. Yeah. No, nothing, nothing's been created because you guys have got to vote. Right. It's, right. Right. it's right. recommended. But, it's, but it's, why it's aren't we treating this using the waiver language of our policy that we have already? I, I think I just. Um, you don't want to be in that position. No, no, no. I mean, we want to be in a position where we're petitioned again and again and again for individual groups asking for individual rules. Okay. What, what you want is you want to have the, the exception be an exception. Okay. That's rarely asked. So, may I ask and, when you would see a situation where we would release the waiver? Thank you. We discuss that. I don't even know what that would be. I, I don't even know. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. I mean, I should ask that. We can ask that when we discuss it. Further. So are all motions off the table? Which we don't have any right yeah. yeah, you only made one you withdrew it. We talked about another one, but it was never made. Yeah. So. That was awesome. <laughs> I finished my report. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait to come back. <laughs> okay. Thank you. That was good and entertaining. Um, okay. Um, another action. So we'll move on to. The other action items. Um, first one is approval to continue the inter district school choice policy JFBB. I so move. Second. Okay, to be clear, this is the policy where we. I want to show, 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 show folks this. Can we approve this every year? Can we approve this we, every year this without is, other students coming to the We, we can stop students from leaving, but we had to accept taking the students in. We had to vote to accept. Yeah. Oh, so this is the vote to the school choice. Yeah. Yes. Not, okay. Not okay. Like other districts. districts. Yeah. Right. We have to Hold do on. it by March. We have to do it in March. Yeah, so, so let me just show folks this. So a lot of verbiage. So this is JFBB. It is families choosing between districts. Okay, so that we will allow uh, our school, our students to go to other districts and allow other districts uh, students. But no, we can't stop kids from going out. No, right. come here. Right. Well, uh, this vote is only saying we'll, we'll, right. so we'll, uh, we'll both go so to the we're place. accepting school choice, okay. not necessarily accepting policy. So no, every year we have to we'll vote renew and report to the yeah. state whether or not we're right. participating in the state's school state. state program. Exactly. Interdistrict report is a state program, but we've got to report to state. Whether or not we are continuing to participate. Yeah, right. I, I mean, I just want to be clear. But that's it's not the, what the vote is on the thing. That it's to accept the policy, not to accept. Yeah. No, it's to continue approve continue inter district continue. school choice comma uh -huh. policy file blah blah blah. Right. So we just review the policy. It's this part of this policy yeah. that we are we need to be in compliance with the state. Okay. So, so I have. I just want to, to make sure we clarify for the for the public because people because we have a lot of. People leaving the district costs us a lot of money because they'll just don't do it. You know, it's right. like we we can't stop kids from leaving. We're gonna pay one way or another, but we don't have a chance to do it. Unless we vote for this, we can't take people in from Manchester, Essex, Rockport, or beyond without this vote, which has to happen every year. Yeah. 
But yeah. since the policies mentioned, I just wanted to bring this up. I don't know whether to bring it up on the vote or before or after, but I just don't want to lose sight of this. We're going to do the vote first because I want to refer it. Okay. Not this case. Okay. So any more discussion? So the vote is to accept. Yes. Yes. Um, is this for a certain school year? This year. 2000 this year? No, that's 23, 24. Thank you. Mr. Melvin? Yes. Mr. Minio? Yes. Ms. Prince? Yes. Mia Berger? Yes. Ms. Watson? Yes. Ms. Weeson? Yes. And Chair President Lindsay? Yes. At the risk of extending the meeting, I do have some data on school choice and 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 can show you just what the numbers are. You've asked for us that when we did the school did enrollment report in the fall, you didn't have the school choice numbers. Yeah. I have those now. If you asked for them, should I show them? Yeah, you can show them. Is it the lot of information? Depends or? how many questions I get. <laughs> <laughs> you want to show it? Just show it. You're not allowed okay, so to ask school questions. Into GPS from the district. So these are folks from other places coming to here. Okay. That is. Uh, 21, 25, 28 students, okay? This is school choice in brother districts by grade level. Okay. This is school choice out to other districts over the last six or seven years. Okay. So that, that does not include Essex Tech. This is, and this is the school choice for, for this current year out by town. Okay, so for students who live in Gloucester, going to other school districts, not a six tech. Okay. I'll show you the breakdown of Rockport a little bit, okay. This is Essex Tech. So pretty consistent. Interesting about Essex Tech this year, which is which is an anomaly, is you have very few kids in the upper grade and a much higher. Typically in the past years, you've seen this equally distributed across different grades at the high school. This is an anomaly. I'm not quite sure why, but you see 42 at um, at, uh, at ninth grade and a lot fewer at the other grades. Could it be something to do with pandemic enrollment. I'm not quite sure, but that's different than we typically see. Okay. There's been there's been quite a bit of attrition back into Foster High over the past few years from from, from Rockport. Yes, yes. And then this is the last slide. This is Rockport's, our choice into Rockport from Gloucester. Okay, you see on the totals on the right, 235, six years ago down to 181. That's 54 students. Fewer now than there were. See, and you see declines at every area, but particularly at, at um, elementary and, and the high school in this order than, than uh, less at the, the middle. Um, so I think that's one, I think that's interesting. I think it's helpful. And um, you see particular, you know, kids coming back since um, the pandemic as well. So um, we'd like to see all of these numbers, people have been choosing out go down. Um, as you can see here, they've gone out some recently. Um, let's see, go, go further, we're gonna educate all our Foster families and foster kids in, in, in Oxford schools. So um, I'd like to see this continue to go down. Just want to make sure. Any questions about that? Just say the efforts we make to give seventh and eighth graders information about Foster High and fourth and fifth graders information about Omele is always going to be extremely important. Yeah, Otherwise, absolutely. those and kids preschoolers. Are the yeah. preschooler, so and so you're seeing some some of that more to do, you know. It's not, yeah. but it's our our team going to the, the, the schools, you know, that helps. Um, Lastly, flyer for the tech program here. Yep, the high school students um, going and talking about all the enrichment programs at O'Malley. Um, you know, we can also improve when the class high school students come down and, and talk about. Um, uh, the high school in terms of our general presentation, but, there, but there's also, anyway, there's uh, there's also, I mean, the O'Malley Science Labs, you know, that thing on, on, on um, and how we can utilize that more, you know, from uh, 1623, um, our, you know, our Facebook presence, you know, really publishing, you know, putting out there, 
um, you know, just the great work is happening across our district. And I think another another area, um, I think performing arts is, is is booming, getting stronger, and getting more notoriety. But then I think another area we can really push is you know the CAD programs or box programs, engineering programs here at high school. Um, some of the other folks don't offer to our degree. You know, there's a great progression there, and we do more in um, publicizing those programs. And then for next meeting. Where I need to report on the Boston, uh, the writing awards that were just mentioned in the Boston Globe. And I don't have the, the details, but we were the only school in our vicinity with kids who got awarded. No mm -hmm. So we'll wow. make sure we highlight that. I like that. Something key, maybe some gold. Oh, yes. I'll have to look for details. Okay. All right. So before we leave this policy, oh yeah, go ahead. Um, I'd like to refer this policy to program um, to see how you know how we have families asking about the the redistricting that we did and, and their ability for siblings to get in as a priority, if possible, down the road. Um, after the plan, we did a five-year plan, but there seems to be some families that are lingering. So I'd be curious to see if this policy can accommodate any of that, if we need to add it to a policy, or if it's just a discussion we have um, as ongoing discussions about when we get to that year, will there be room, right? So it affects this policy. No, I know. This is the, this is not in district. This policy. Oh, that's the inter-district policy? This is, yeah, this is inter-district. This is between different districts. Okay. This policy. Then we don't need to do that as long as the inter-district policy reflects that somewhere. That, that I don't know if we have to modify that policy to say that we may be able to give a special um, priority treatment. It just should be in writing somewhere. I mean, the school committee can look totally different in two years if people didn't run, right? So we just messaging consistent in a policy. So I would just like to see if that language needs to be changed or if there's other safeguards in place to have that discussion down the road. Um, but this policy, I would like to refer um, in reading number seven and eight. Um, I can't help but wonder if how we would address a situation where a student who is currently in our schools and then moves to another district, but wants to stay in the school for the remainder of the year. And I don't know that this policy covers that situation. I mean, um, I, this says that you have to request by the beginning of the year, but when a student moves mid-year, yeah. it doesn't address the issue um, if whether or not they can stay under school choice knowing they were here for a majority of the year. I, I know somebody actually personally who was in that situation. So it's happened a couple of times yeah, in the past couple like of years. Well, so the I student starts here. Starts uh, here, moves to another district, yeah, meaning like moves like to Rockford, Peabody yeah. or Rockport, yeah. but yet request to stay here in the school to, to no, finish out the year. Yeah. Doesn't make sense to make a child start a new school no. in February. Right. So um, this policy doesn't address that situation. It kind of just gives it a cutoff that if you don't apply at the beginning of the year, then you, the answer is no. So I just want to have that flexibility for what is in the best interest of the child if we have the room. But is that the vehicle for that to? Yeah, so in this case, yes. It is. Obviously, it, there's it, room. It, it is. The, well, the that's a there. discussion, though. What so you're looking at is, is number seven here. Right? That the applicants will not be accepted after the first quarter of the school right. year. That very specific language keeps us from. Keeping, this, keeping a school. student, you know, within the school without, you know, because because you know, you move districts, you have to, you know, move school obviously, and they're not eligible to apply for school choice at that point. And I think I I would recommend that we have a conversation that they can stay so long as it doesn't impose a class that's too crowded. But if the child was already in the yeah. class, what yeah. shouldn't change? Yeah. So, but I think we just need to look at that language so that if the subcommittee agrees that. Those situations that don't happen very often, but have happened in the past couple of years since we developed this policy, can be addressed. Yeah, I don't, there you go. I haven't seen any nationality. There you go. We've been working on all the other policies. So, 
So yeah. it's policy JFBB, JFBB and it. specifically around uh, number seven and eight. Thank you. That's some work. That's going to be that. <laughs> No, this is what we want. Oh, because the other one is there. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we have some grants to accept. Um, other grants. Um, I move that we accept the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education grants. Um, the first one is social emotional learning and mental health. On code 311 in the amount of $39,350. And this is for Gloucester High School in O'Malley. Second grant from the Department of Ed is Hate Crimes Prevention Grant, fund code 794-2 in the amount of $48,830 for Gloucester High School in O'Malley. And the third one is the Mass Grad Grant in the amount of $15,000 uh, for Gloucester High School. And I said, second. And so, any of these matching grants or anything, or is this just grants coming our way? I mean, all three of them are grants that we have previously had, and it's dedicated us more money for them. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. Ray, roll call vote, please. Mr. Melvin? Yes. Mr. Minio? Yes. Ms. Prince? Yes. Mayor Berga? Yes. Ms. Watson? Yes. Ms. Wieson? Yes. And Chairperson Prince? Yes. Okay. Um, then the second group of grants is also from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education Amendments. Um, first one is Mental Health, Social, Emotional Learning, Fund Code 332 slash 311, grant in the amount. Oh, isn't that the same? That's a duplicate. That's a duplicate. Yep. Again, I said that part. Okay, <laughs> Title I, Fund Code 305, grant in the amount of $1,175. Title II A fund code 140 grant in the amount of $1,124. IDEA fund code 240 grant, $4,282. Early Childhood fund code grant 262 in the amount of $104. And I so vote. Yeah. Any discussion? Okay, roll call vote. Mr. Melvin? Yes. Mr. Caminio? Yes. Ms. Prince? Yes. Mayor Berta? Yes. Ms. Watson? Yes. Ms. Wilson? Yes. 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 <clears throat> so that concludes the action items. Um, East Veterans Elementary School update. Budget on time. <laughs> Looks great. Under budget on time. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we're going to have a school committee uh, tour on second. We were suggesting April 4th. Mm -hmm. Tuesday. The Tuesday is the third. Yes, April fourth. April fourth. Yeah, yeah. Tuesday, April fourth. Um, we have two people that can't do it. We're hearing over the line. Can't do Tuesdays. Tuesdays. Are you the chair working a date? Stephanie working a date? Yeah. Will Monday be okay? Not if it's a set um, for our school team. We're doing that day. I want to see it. All right. Yeah. Any yeah. Monday after. Yeah. Let's try for the yeah. yeah. Um, I think we really do want to get in the building sooner than not because um, it's just a lot of really good progress and things to see um, while it's still actually happening as opposed to going in and saying, oh, that's that. So it's kind of a lot done, but still a lot. Progress. I don't know. It's kind of fun to watch. How, no, how it forward, and um, we are now three months from substantial completion. Wow. So we are moving. Wait, Brian, did you come in? So we want to see what the skeletons are. Pretty good one. No skeleton. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah. Oh, we are. Uh, City Council has been invited to the door on the twenty seventh. That's Monday. That may move. That may move. That may move. All right. All right, so or maybe we take the 25th, 27th, that's the date. So we'll this have to Monday. 27th, this coming Monday. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Right. Yeah. What time? Uh, 3 30. Oh, the Oh, no, we have um, negotiation. Yeah. For that day, 
<laughs> you, oh, they weren't in the jury during the day. That's during during the day. Saturday. It's, it's, it's during not the as easy during the day because they're oh, a little bit okay. Okay. more dangerous. <clears throat> I'll have to step your job. Yes, please. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Saturday. Because they are doing a little bit of work on Saturday. It doesn't work on Saturday. So it's there. Yeah, Saturday would be work. Ideally. Maybe less coordinating. I think so. so okay. Okay. All right. Cool. I might have to bring my team. Okay. All right. So that's um, any other business anybody wants to go we'll judge? Second. Mr. Melvin. Yes. Dominion. Yes. Ms. Prince. Yes. Mayor Virgo. Yes. Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Leeson. Yeah. My person plans. Yes. Good night. Okay. Night, everyone. Thank you for the attendees.